in the middle of the night. On August 6, 1977, a young couple is making out in a car when they're killed without any warning. I want that man to go right in hell. Shortly after, another couple's killed. Police are looking for a serial killer. Who knows who did it? I mean, it could be somebody that I know well. The killer has a strong interest in young brunettes. This man was a great pretender, and he was a monster. He's a con man, and he knows how to play the game. Investigators desperately want information. It was at that time that I realized someone in my family killed a lot of people. If I felt that bad about it, I wouldn't have done it to start with. This is the story of a young woman who discovered secrets and keep quiet, and that she had to tell the world. Jefferson County is a great rural place. It's one of those places where people say, you know, it's a great place to raise a family, to have kids. County population is about 85,000 people, so small area and really kind of out in the boonies. It was a place called the Concord House. The Concord House was a local event space in Jefferson County. It was well known for wedding receptions, birthday parties. Sometimes there were bands and music. Attending one of the wedding receptions was Tim Hack and Kelly Drew. Tim Hack and Kelly Drew are high school sweethearts. They're both 19 years of age and very much young and in love. Tim liked to do a lot of uh, with tractors and tractor pulls. Kelly Drew was a young brunette who worked at the Dairy Queen and also at a hair salon. That night after the wedding reception, Tim and Kelly left together, but they never came home. Next day, Tim Hack's father finds his son's Oldsmobile still parked at the Concord House, where the wedding reception took place. Tim's wallet was still in the car. The car was running. There was no mechanical issue. It started up right away, so Tim's dad knew something was wrong because if Tim was ever late, if he wasn't going to come home, he let the family know. Law enforcement searched the area for Tim and Kelly and began interviewing different people that had contact with them on the night of August 9th, 1980. They went through the guest list that they could. This became a huge ordeal for the community. As this is a farming community, this is an area where people leave their keys in their cars, where they don't lock their doors, and things like this just don't happen. They arrived at the Concord House around 10.30 p.m., and the teens walked out the front door after about a half hour. There's nothing to indicate uh, what happened to the people. The impact on the community was panic. People suspected and believed that something, you know, sinister had occurred. Fighting to Kelly Drew including her underwear scattered along the road. The clothing appeared to have been cut with some sort of sharp instrument. Pieces of rope were found along the same road, so we believe that there could be sexual assault involved in, in the disappearance. There were numerous searches done by local fire departments, National Guard, helicopters. Dogs were used, people on horseback. Very large searches conducted throughout the area. However, nothing was panning out.
two months after Tim and Kelly disappeared, squirrel hunters discover a gruesome scene, the remains of a female body. The following day, another body is discovered approximately 70 feet away. Police identify the remains as the bodies of the missing couple, Tim Hack and Kelly Drew. Kelly Drew's cause of death was strangulation. And Tim Hack's death was caused by a stab wound, pleased to have been caused by a sharp instrument. The night that the couple goes missing, there were actually two wedding receptions happening. So there were hundreds of people that the police had to investigate. They had a lot of suspects, um, a lot of follow-up that was done. But ultimately, things go cold. The murders of Tim Hack and Kelly Drew will remain unsolved for years and become known as the Sweetheart Murders. It isn't until almost 30 years later, in 2000... The state of Wisconsin got a cold case grant to look at five potential cold cases, and the Sweetheart Murders were selected as one of the five. Kelly Drew's underwear, as well as some other clothing, were sent to the state crime lab for DNA testing. From Kelly's pants and underwear, we received DNA and the DNA found was from semen. In 2009, Wisconsin authorities released this information to the media, hoping someone will come forward with new information. It was a Sunday night. I was on my to open cold cases, and the sweetheart and murders were one of them. So I started reading, and then... <gasps> It was at that time that I realized I had seen the Concord House before. And I was shaking. I, 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 I was shaking because immediately I knew who it was that had committed the murders. In 2009, April Bellaccio came across a news report about a Wisconsin cold case called the Sweetheart Murders, and she thinks her childhood memories may lead to the killer. April Bellaccio is the oldest of five kids. Her father was Edward Wayne Edwards, and her mother was Kay Edwards. Growing up, the Edwards kids seemed to have a great childhood. On the trails at Halloween, my parents tried to do everything on a grand scale when it came to holidays and family dinners and birthday dinners and tried to make things special to us. The Edwards family appeared to have the perfect life and it was financially supported by the overnight success of April's father's autobiographical book. In 1972, Ed Edwards publishes Metamorphosis of a Criminal, the true life story of Ed Edwards. Edward Edwards was sent to turn his life around and promote himself as a reformed criminal. He not only writes a book, he becomes a motivational speaker, and he's very outspoken on the need for prison reform. Edwards becomes a darling of the speaking circuit. He speaks at universities, he speaks at schools. Soon, Edward was being booked by radio shows, and he even did TV shows. Will the real Ed Edwards please stand up? Ah! I knew from a very young age that my dad was in jail. It was to be proud of or not to be proud of. It's just something that we knew my dad did. But his book's popularity begins to wane 
and Ed Edwards' 15 minutes of fame comes to an end. And so do the good times. Unfortunately for Ed, motivational speaking isn't the most lucrative gig in the world, and it's not enough to support him and his family. But with the carpentry skills that Edwards acquired while in prison, he's able to work a variety of odd jobs and moves his family wherever those jobs take him. Grapes together enough money to buy a modest home in Doylestown, Ohio. They move into an older home, and Edward spends time renovating the house to basically make space for his burgeoning family. Not a lot of people know Edward. He's new to town. They don't know his family very well. So he decides it's probably best to build his reputation as a family man and a hardworking, law-abiding citizen, and he starts befriending the local law enforcement. Edwards endears himself as a resource, using his charm. Because of his ability to talk to people, a lot of people talk to him. And even though he wasn't a drinker, per se, it wouldn't be past him to go into one of the local bars and just listen. He provided information regarding burglary, theft, some narcotics trafficking, and some of the information he gave did generate arrests. This characterizes Edwards as a useful informant. FBI agents, they were just in our circle all the time. It made my dad feel important, and he got a pride out of that. But according to April, not everyone was happy about Edward's relationship with the police. It seems that with newfound friends came newfound enemies. One evening, Edward takes his family to the movies. When they return, they find the home engulfed in flames. I remember just thinking as a young child, what happened? And there was evidence that there was arson. So someone had attempted to burn the house down which scared my parents. Concerned for their children's safety, Ed and Kay are forced to move the family. And it's the beginnings of one long bohemian journey. With no one ever caught for the arson, Edwards moves his family to a new home in a new state nearly every six months, afraid that he ratted on the wrong person. That there were bad people after us because of the knowledge that my dad had. We always had to keep it a secret where we moved to so that they wouldn't come after us. But it appears to April, whoever is after Edwards is relentless in their pursuit, and the family constantly feels like they're in grave danger. I remember one time we were living in Ohio, and my dad was building our second house, and there was a young man that was helping my dad build the house. But something happened to him. And my dad sold the house unfinished. Then there was another incident while we were living in Wisconsin. One night, I remember my dad coming home. He had a cut on his nose. And while we had only lived there for a very short period of time, there again, we left in the middle of the night. We ended up in Pennsylvania. By 1982, April and her family find stable ground in Slippery Rock, Pennsylvania. And then the unthinkable happens. Takes his children to camp. And at this exact time, the house burns down again. The following morning, investigators come in 
and once again they're able to detect that it was in fact arson. But that's not everything. This time, police catch a break. The perpetrators actually come forward and their confessions will change the Edwards family forever. In 1982, while investigating the arson of the Edwards family home, investigators catch a break when three of the perpetrators come forward. Police learn from the Edwards sons that Edwards had enlisted them to help burn down the home in an effort to collect insurance money. When my brothers confessed, I was just devastated. How can you make your child do that? And I remember thinking to myself, I don't think my dad's a very nice man. The people after Edwards found him in Pennsylvania, and he had to escape, but he needed money to do it. With this admission, Edwards is arrested for arson and sentenced to two years in prison in Pennsylvania. But when he got out of prison, I didn't trust my dad. And I just remember getting a job. I'm just going to get out of the house as soon as I could. And that's what I did. Seven, he focuses his energies on the four remaining children in the household, trying once again to be the father he was during their early childhood. Ed Edwards was extremely active in the schools. He was always supporting his kids who were uh, top-notch athletes. In addition to helping out with his sons, Ed also shows a compassionate side. He takes in Danny Glockner, who's a local teen that's been in the foster system for most of his life. Danny Glockner went to school with Edwards' kids. They all knew each other. They lived in the same general vicinity. It seems that Edwards has a soft spot for this young man, likely because he had a similar childhood. My father was an illegitimate child. When he was approximately five years old, his mother committed suicide. And he grew up in the orphanage. So my father went through his childhood feeling unloved. And I guess my father did not want that for Danny. Eventually, the bond that Danny and Edward share is like that of a... Adopted by Edward, but a judge said that he was too old. However, he did say that he could change his name to Danny Boy Edwards. After high school, Edward encouraged Danny Boy to join the military. He really thought it was a good place for kids to get their life on track. After finishing basic training, Danny is about to be stationed in Korea when he hurts his ankle. Because of his injury, Danny Boy Edwards is about to be medically discharged from the military. And his reaction is extreme. Danny, when... With no sign of Danny Boy, his family and friends search for him tirelessly. But their efforts prove futile. Danny Boy is missing. Almost a year later, hunters stumble upon a shallow grave in the woods behind the cemetery. The body is badly decomposed. It takes a week for the coroner to identify. The remains belong to Dad Death. It's a shotgun blast to the back of his head. When Edwards finds out that it's Danny Boy, he goes crazy. He's distraught. He tells police officers he'll do anything to help find out who killed his foster son. 
Danny Boy's murder became an obsession for my father. And my dad talked about the murder nonstop. He actually went around at Danny Boy's funeral asking people what they thought had happened to Danny Boy, you know, what their ideas. It was given to us throughout the country. And nothing panned out. We just didn't have enough information. Years pass. Then one night after an Edwards family gathering, all five now grown children are talking when the conversation turns to Danny Boy's murder. All five of us, my siblings and I, we were all just hoping to figure it out. And then April's siblings talk about the time that their mother was actually in hospital in 1982. Fact, because Edward had stabbed her. Supposedly, the boys had eaten the bag of chips. He came home, he wanted the bag of chips. He was upset, Branding and Raven. Mom was trying to calm him down. He had the knife, he stabbed her. I just couldn't believe it. I was saddened. I was also shocked. I mean, until that moment, I didn't even chips. Certainly, if he could reach that level of rage over a bag of potato chips, there's no telling what he's capable of. After April's brothers share that when they were kids, Edward stabbed their mother, April and her siblings begin to wonder if their family's past. Together, they're going over their life, all the moving and oftentimes in the middle of the night without warning. This made these adult children wonder if their father isn't so innocent. April asks herself, if they were on the run as kids because her father snitched on the wrong people or because her father could have done unspeakable things. The idea that their father could have been a murderer begins to take root in April. Searching for evidence of criminal activity that her father may have committed, including murders she starts looking for clues and retracing her family's footsteps across the country in the 70s and 80s looking for correlating murders at the same time after trying to do this investigation on my own of different cold cases there's nothing out there nothing nothing But there's one place that she forgets to search. And then I saw something about the state of Wisconsin had just given a bunch of money to, to open cold cases, and the sweetheart murders were one of them. And I just vaguely remembered that at the time of the murders, we lived in the house in that area. And as I continued reading, I remembered that I had seen the Concord house before, which is where Tim and Kelly, the sweetheart couple, were the last seen. But April recognizes the name of the reception hall. She remembers it because her father used to work there. Ed Edwards was the handyman of the Concord House back in 1980. And then it was like a release. Childhood memories started coming back. 
everything was very vivid, very vivid. I remember the night my dad came home with a cut on his nose, and he had told my mom. But when the authorities came to the house, he told them that the cut on his nose was related to hunting. And we left in the middle of the night. After that, my dad talked about those murders nonstop. And they were an obsession to my father. For years, I had these memories locked somewhere in my mind. And at that moment, I was in shock. At the end of the article, it says, if you have any further information, call Detective Carl. In that conversation, I told him that I thought that my dad committed the murders. Detective Garcia is intrigued and looks into Edward Wayne Edwards, trying to verify any connection to the sweetheart murders. What he discovers is unnerving. Ed Edwards was interviewed in September of 1980, strictly because of his working at the Concord House. He said that he was not at the Concord House on the evening of August 9th. At the time when this interview occurred, he, looking through the file, we later learned from Edwards' landlord that Edwards left Wisconsin within a day of being interviewed and traveled to Pennsylvania with his wife and children. So everything that April told me is starting to add up. I next purchased the book, Metamorphosis of a Criminal. And in reading it, I find um, very disturbing things. I find a psychological profile, an interest in fire, and that he has a lot of mental issues. I find that he admits to using women abusing her murder victim, Kelly Drew, who was a young brunette. In putting all these things together, he is moving up my suspect list rapidly. Detective Garcia immediately tracks down Edward Edwards, who's living in a trailer park in Louisville, Kentucky with his wife, Kay. I went to the residence of Edwards and conducted an interview of him. At this point, Edward is over 75 years old, and he's been in poor health for several years. Let me tell you who we are and why we're here. Okay. okay. Long ways away. But anyway, we're following up on the two teenagers, the guy and the girl that disappeared from the Concord house. The Concord house. Yeah. Concord house. Oh, okay. The Concord, is that the dance hall or a bar or whatever? Yeah, right. Okay, yeah, I was doing the floor up there or something in the barn or whatever. He did not specifically recall Tim and Kelly. He said that he had never met them, and that the names were not familiar to him. Do you recall injuring your nose at any time when you lived in Wisconsin? I injured my nose. Like so you didn't take advantage of our deer hunting? He was no. the best deer hunting around. No. At the conclusion of the interview, I asked Edwards for his DNA. I'm going to go for that. Well, unfortunately, these gentlemen don't have a whole lot of time. We're from Wisconsin, so we do be willing to do it now or no? No. No, I got to think about this. Edwards said that he would not provide his DNA. But prior to meeting with Edwards, I obtained a DNA search warrant. A search warrant? When compared to the semen sample found on Drew's underwear, it's a perfect match. is now charged with the murders of Tim Hack and Kelly Drew. Mr. Edwards is implicated by DNA evidence as well as other cooperating evidence. It's mixed emotions. I think everybody's happy to know that, you know, they're not living next to a killer.
when I found out that my dad had murdered, or just literally hyperventilating. And that's when it really hit me. Although he doesn't confess to the murders of Tim Hack and Kelly Drew, authorities are sure they have the right man and extradite Edward Edwards from Kentucky to Wisconsin for prosecution. I want that man to face the facts here of what he did and, and then go rot in hell. Edwards is in poor health at this time. He's on an oxygen tank and he had very bad diabetes. It's at this point, Edward decides that he doesn't want to suffer in jail. He wants the death penalty. But Wisconsin doesn't have the death penalty. So that's when Edwards decides. We have lethal injection here in Ohio. And so in 2010, we received a letter from Edwards. And he explained how once we talk with him, that we will want to put a needle in his arm. Having no idea what was in store for them, detectives from Norton, Ohio, travel to Wisconsin and sit down with the aging Edwards. I told him, I said, I'm gonna tell you something, Bill. I'm gonna kill you. While waiting to be sentenced to life in prison for the sweetheart murders, 76-year-old Edward Wayne Edwards lures Ohio authorities out to meet him in Wisconsin, spinning a new tale. In 1977, in Doylestown, Ohio, Billy Lavaco is a local young guy. He's also a carpenter, and he and Edwards would work together on odd jobs quite a lot. But one night, Edwards sees Billy Lavaco, who was in his early 20s at the time, playing with April. April. I told him that if he did not stop making eyes and fooling around with my small children, being around him, that he was going to end up getting hurt. Lavaco just kind of looks at him like, well, whatever, Ed, you know, know what the problem is, you know. I told him, I said, I'm going to tell you something, Bill. I'm going to kill you. Edwards becomes fixated on the idea that Billy Lavaco molested April. And so he hatches a plan for retribution. One night, he decides to put his plan into action. He sees Billy in his... Billy and Judith go to Lover's Lane. They're kissing. They don't know who's there. And Edwards goes up to them with a shotgun. It was dark. Judith did not recognize me. I know she didn't. And I told her to stay in the car. I want to talk to him. And I said, please. She insisted time. Bill says, look, Wayne, there's $500 in her purse in the car. If you want money, why don't you just get it? I said, Bill, do you know what she just did? And at that moment, I shot him and killed him. What he just did was tell her who I was. Edwards then shoots Judy in the throat, killing her almost instantly as well. I didn't threaten her. There was no pleading and things like this here. Unfortunately, Judy was in the wrong place. If there was any child molestation going on with Billy. Other than that's what Ed Edwards said. To the best of my recollection, Billy was a young man that was helping my dad build the house. But at the time, when I was a child, I didn't know that Billy had been murdered. And as an adult, I had never researched the Norton murders. I didn't put two and two together. After Edwards admits to the unsolved killings of Billy Lavaco and Judy Straub, he assumes that since the murders occurred in Ohio, 
that he'd be eligible for- Assumes that the death penalty is in place and later learns that the death penalty was not on the books in Ohio when that double murder occurred. So he's now confessed to two murders where he can't get the death penalty. With four charges of murder against him, Edwards keeps pushing. I deserve it and I want the death penalty. So this leads him to confess to another murder. I put the shotgun kind of right here over his shoulder, right down here, easy, and I pulled the trigger. The murder of his foster son, Danny Boy Edwards. Danny didn't know he was going to get shot. And... Upon joining the military, Danny is placed into basic training where he's offered an insurance plan. Edwards convinces Danny to pay extra for maximum benefits. According to Edwards, he was going to kill Danny when Danny got out of basic training to collect insurance money. However, Danny had an injury to an ankle, which precluded he would be discharged on a medical, and there would be no benefits. Instead of taking a medical discharge from the army, Edwards is able to convince Danny that his best Danny agrees. Edwards admits to luring Danny Boy to the secluded cemetery near his home. So Danny had a duffel bag with his clothing, some money and some cigarettes. Edwards was talking to Danny and he said, Danny, reach down and get me a cigarette out of your bag. He was bent over, kneeling down and get around. He didn't even know I had a shotgun when I shot him in the chest. With Danny, I saw an opportunity here at the long range. It took about a year to set it up. Of it. I asked Edwards, do you have any remorse? He goes, I'm sorry I had to kill him. In exchange for his admission, in August 2010, Edwards gets his wish. And in regards to count one of the indictment, aggravated murder, that you be sentenced to death by lethal injection. But Edwards has been in poor health for several years, and in 2011, he dies from natural causes in prison. It's a month before his scheduled execution. never want to do that to my child. There are a lot of regrets on my part, a lot of guilt. The guilt of um, turning your father in, but then the guilt of not turning him in sooner. It's a no-win situation. The story is fascinating because Edwards was a great pretender. Serial killers tend to be charming and assimilate in their communities. But what stands out about Edwards, man, including his own kids? In truth, the Edwards family was never running from bad people. They moved constantly because Edwards had to elude trouble with the law. And he was killing the whole time. Ed Edwards was manipulative. I think that lying to people and deceiving people and even killing people was to prove how much better he was, how much stronger he was, and what he could get away with. And because of that, I believe that Edwards committed more homicides than what he confessed to. And Detective Garcia is not alone in this belief. There were family camping trips, but hindsight they were not typical family camping trips. My dad wasn't always with us. He was not in the tents with us. And it makes me wonder, just makes me really wonder. And it's just going to be something that's just going to bother me to the day that I die. I just believe there's so many more out there. Did you want 
you offer any apologies to any of your victims' families? Oh, that's uh, uh, for me to say. I wouldn't. Oh no, that no. Naturally, uh, I'm I'm sorry and everything. But uh, if I felt that bad about it, I wouldn't have done it to start with. <laughs>